Good evening and welcome once again to Insight Live. We hope you are well and tonight we're tackling a subject that we've ne never tackled before and it's how to have victory over pornography. And we're going to be interviewing a young man. He's only 22 years old, the youngest guest that we've ever had on Insight Live. And he's written a book called Behind Closed Doors. And his name is Henry Turnbull. And he's going to be sharing his story about how he overcame a six-year addiction to pornography. Hi, uh, yes, and welcome from me, Melanie. Tuesday night, Insight Live, we are live and interactive. And I know it's a delicate subject and you are very welcome to write in incognito. Um, you know, if you are still struggling, obviously, but if you have got over it and you're quite happy to give your testimony of what Jesus has done in your life, we would be, you know, very happy to read out how God has given you victory over this. And we're not only speaking about men and pornography, because most of us think, oh, yes, it's men who have the problem. But, uh, you know, when you've been in the ministry quite a long time, uh, you see that women also have problems in these areas. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's when people are bored, Kurt, yeah. that they take on these things and then it grabs a hold of them. But uh, we're excited to have, have Henry Turnbull and uh, to interview him and uh, introduce his book. Uh, you know, such a young man, such a young yeah. age, praise God, he's got victory over this yeah. and uh, he's able to share that with yeah. us tonight. Well, I was just going over some statistics and it said in the States, 46% of all pastors have some type of pornography addiction. Pastors. I'm saying that's pastors. So if that's pastors, you can imagine the rest of the people, but yet 7% of the churches address it wisely and intelligently. Mm. So where do people go? If you do have an addiction to pornography, it's like most people, especially if you're a pastor or a leader, a prominent member in society, it's not like you can go and say, hey, I'm addicted to pornography. It's mm. one thing that you, you, you feel shame about. And then yes. if you're a, wim, a woman, I would imagine it's even more shameful to come out of the closet. So this is a serious problem. And mm. I, I don't really know why we're not more upfront about it in churches. Exactly. But one, one of the interesting scenarios we had was that this woman was having um, you know, terrible dreams. And, uh, and so you know, we said, well, let's look at your computer, what you've been looking at and all this. And then this turned out. And it was like, we can't believe that she didn't say to us, you know, I've been having this problem. And then we were able to deal with it. There was a lot of demonic stuff. So she was able to, we were able to be able to get rid of those demons. And uh, it was just, you know, it's, it's really wonderful when people are set free. And uh, we always pray that they'll be set, f you know, stick with it to be set free completely because sometimes people get free partially and then it's still a problem. But the full freedom in Christ is what we're after. Yeah. I mean, I personally think, you know, the human body, it's a work of art. God made the human body. It's to be admired, to savored, uh, treasured, but not abused. And that's the problem I have with a lot of pornography is the violence, the sadism. You have that book, what, Fifty Shades of Grey. Why on earth would anybody want to read a book like that, that kind of glorifies that sadism, that masochism, and that's not God's design. No. But we have Song of Solomon here, and I'm going to read a little bit, and I think this is God's design. So if we're going to talk about sex, you know, let's talk about good sex. Mm. Let's not talk about something that's done in shamefully or in the dark. And if you're a young person, I was telling Henry, uh, who we're going to interview just now, and maybe about 10 minutes from now, I was just having a discussion when I was, I was born in 1960. So of course, when I was 10 years old, 12 years old, I heard about pornography. And of course I was curious because I'm a curious person. And then just to get hold of a, what we say, a Playboy magazine in those days, you had to ask an adult and an adult went into the local 7-Eleven store and maybe if the adult was nice or stupid, <laughs> you would give it to, <laughs> yeah. to, to the kid, okay? And that's the only way that I could get hold of pornography in those days when I was, you know, a mere 12 year old lad. But it was mild, let me just let it me was, comment. It was it very was mild, mild. Because it was only showing the top part of the yeah, woman's body. And, and today but it would just be a PG movie, you know, it would just be a PG movie today. But now, and then when I went to Catholic school, I was in a dorm with 50 boys and they were all 16 years old. And of course I learned about women from, no, 15 year old boys, which was pretty stupid. 
and everybody was bragging and pretending that blah, 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 and it was all, it was all a farce. So apart from that, I didn't really have much training or there was no internet. So, but imagine if you're a young person today, literally, you, you take up your phone and your you, you can see yeah. anything. And if you're 12 years old, this is your sexual education. This, you're being introduced to sex and, and all of this at such an early age age, but perhaps in such a perverse yeah. way that's yeah. not God's design. Well, I, I, you know, my testimony is that my, my, my mom basically told us about all the things that we needed to know, you know, by the age of 10. And it was in a good way, um, in, a, in a godly way. Uh, we were churchgoers, uh, even though my parents weren't born again until much later. But my father still had the scope pictures inside the cupboard. We saw, you know, the woman's breasts and everything. And my mother accepted it. And it was something that was acceptable. And we went to church every Sunday. But obviously, you know, once you have a true relationship with Jesus and, and, and we give our lives to him, that is not something that's acceptable. But before you launch into a Song of Solomon, Kurt, you know, the, the thing that we miss so many times in modern society is the fact that we are free to express ourselves sexually within the frame of marriage, within the frame of a covenant where we've made a promise with that, to that other person. And that is where there's trust, that's where there's love and freedom, and that's where there's supposed to be no abuse, you know, where there's that love and that respect. But then when there are multiple partners and it's outside of marriage, then that's when the enemy comes in and you find that there's abuse and, and obviously there's shame. And on the women's side is when we just actually find that we are, you know, we trash ourselves. You yeah. know, we regret things and then there's unwanted pregnancies. And so I think stepping outside God's plan always has bad ramifications. And it's like just a spiral of sin just catches up with us. Yeah. So in the light of that, Kurt's going to read But it, uh, it's Song interesting, you know, you know, before I read this, I'm kind of comparing myself to this young man, Solomon or, or whoever it was that <laughs> loves this young girl. And I'm saying, well, hey, compared to him, I think I'm a bad lover. <laughs> I don't like write you long poems and oh, no. track down the right essential oils necessarily or spend three hours admiring your feet <laughs> or whatever, ah, like I, this guy that, does. That could be good. That could be good. But, but let's read this. And, you know, I remember I was a young man in Bible college in my 20s and everybody else was young and the hormones are raging and that's where you kind of like look for your <laughs> life partner and so on. And so we would all like read Song of Solomon and, and giggle. But, you know, it was all from like the King James English and so on. And we read it and we did, and, and then one girl drew a, a picture of the woman that that what I'm about to read. Uh, <laughs> yes. and, and I looked at the woman. And I said, no, I couldn't be attracted to a woman <laughs> like that at all. You know, and but it's not like that. They used the, the poetry, the imagery of their day. It was very contemporary, very um, sensual, you know, so it's kind of lost some of its um, uh, uh, charm on us because it's it's such an old translation and we'll laugh at some of the things when, when I read it. But in uh, Song of Solomon chapter 7 from the Good News translation, just liked it, and it said, what a magnificent, magnificent young woman you are. Or what an extraordinary woman you are, Melanie. How beautiful are your feet in sandals. The guy just like starts from the bottom up. You notice, <laughs> see, it's just like, how would you like to, you know, be in these kind of, what are these, these lights called? The fluorescent lights, yes, yes. you know, where you're just in a room and somebody's just looking at you and, 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 and commenting on every part of your body, you know? So he's just starting with the feet here. The curve of your thighs is like the work of an artist. A bowl is there that never runs out of spiced wine. A sheaf of wheat is there, surrounded by lilies. Okay, this is a lot of code going on here. Your breasts are like twin deer, like two gazelles. Your neck is like a tower of ivory. Your nose is as lovely as a tower of Lebanon that stands guard at Damascus. Now that doesn't go over very well <laughs> in our culture. So maybe a, an exercise would be rewrite this. You know, make it sound like too sexy for this program. Okay, your head is held high like Mount Carmel. Your braided hair shines like the finest satin. Its beauty could hold a king captive. 
how pretty you are, how beautiful, how complete the delights of your love. You are as graceful as a palm tree. Your breasts are like clusters of dates. And I love dates. I was just eating dates today, actually. <laughs> I will climb the palm tree and pick its fruit. To me, your breasts are like bunches of grapes, your breath like the fragrance of apples, and your mouth like the finest wine. Now, hey, this is the Bible. Nobody can say, you know, accuse me of not saying the Bible. And it says, meditate on the words of scripture. So I tried this once, you know, I told you. And I went walking for two hours, and I said, I'm just gonna think of my wife's feet. That's all. <laughs> and maybe massaging her feet. So for two hours, I took off. And I said, whoa, this is just how beautiful, you know, this is, you know. And I always, she always, if we're watching television, she'll put her foot up and I always have to massage her feet. But isn't this beautiful that, that this man is just concentrating and focusing on the whole woman? He's captivated, captivated by her inner beauty, her outer beauty. And then in turn, read the woman, my so darling. So this is, this is the woman speaking of the man. And she says, Then let the wine flow straight to my lover, flowing over his lips and teeth. I belong to my lover and he desires me. Come, darling, let's go out to the countryside and spend the night in the villages. What a pity we can't go to Granada. <laughs> we will get up early and look at the vines to see whether they've started to grow, whether the blossoms are opening and the pomegranate trees are in bloom. There I will give you my love. You can smell the scent of mandrakes and all the pleasant fruits are near our door. Darling, I have kept for you the old delights and the new. Now, that's beautiful. It is. It's not some couple going to some cheap hotel down the road or something. This is going to the countryside. She's prepared his favorite foods. They're gonna spend time together, quality time together. This is what people should study. This is what I should have learned when I was 13 years old, you know, not what's on the internet in the trash, you know, this is, this is what young people should learn and it's worth waiting for. Mm. And it's worth studying, it's worth learning about. And this is kind of my, my take on it. But how does Satan come in? How does Satan, mean the twister, how does he come in and, you know, some rabbis believe that the Song of Solomon is describing love scenes in the Garden of Eden. Mm. Some believe that. So it's almost idyllic. It's, all, it's almost like this heavenly type of style of love to be idealized. But how did the serpent, the twister, the, the forces of evil get in there and twist something that is such a wonderful, beautiful gift just to destroy people's lives. And mm. we're going to show you um, a video of a, a couple right now. And this couple, they got married, okay, and they found out that they were both addicted to pornography, but the story has a fantastic ending. And uh, I think it's just very, very powerful it's a, in its presentation. And later on, we're going to go and uh, meet Henry. I remember the first time that I saw pornography. It was in the seventh grade and I was at a friend's house. He pulls out all these magazines and, and this was a first time experience to even see any of this stuff. And from the age of 11, you know, that, that just became a very powerful force. Uh, I couldn't deal with it. Immediately I was hooked and it happened at a very vulnerable time in my life. I was looking for things that would give me a sense of satisfaction in life and and make me feel alive and give me some identity and some value and some worth. Throughout my teenage years, I used pornography as a crutch. I was raised as a Christian, I knew it was wrong, and I tried to stop, but I just couldn't. And I found myself drifting away from God deeper and deeper into my addiction. I became very angry. The amount of shame and just the amount of guilt that you feel when you're doing things that you know are not healthy. And you can't tell anybody. And so it just becomes this source of, for me, it was anger. A couple years after high school, I married Sarah and we had a daughter. And ironically, I was also a worship leader at a church. 
But even all of that did not help me shake my addiction because by now I had convinced myself that it was normal. I'm trying to live this life and give my life to God. You're, you're dealing with pornography, you've got this little girl, you've got a wife, and how do, you, how do you balance all that? Definitely more feelings of guilt and shame came into the, to the picture. So I drifted farther and farther from God and from Sarah. Then one day she found one of the porn movies that I had rented. She goes, hey, I found this. And that was when she said, well, you know, I, I, I really feel like this is something we could do together. I did not expect that. I later found out that her past was also riddled with pornography. I had a family member that introduced me to pornography during times of sexual abuse. Because of that, and for so many years that I was exposed to it, it was always replaying in my mind. So I thought, well, you know, if we do this together, it could be really exciting. This, you know, it could just maybe take us to a whole nother level. For a while, it was great. But when the excitement wore off, I felt even worse. Now, I'd all but given up on our marriage and on any hope that I could change. So I began looking for something more. Later, I found it while working at a gym when a woman came up to me. And the very first thing out of her mouth was, you're cute, we should go out. And I said, no, I'm married. And she just said, I don't care. So we set up a, uh, an appointment, lunch appointment. And I went and paid cash for a, a hotel. I said, yeah, this is it. But the day that we were supposed to meet, she sent me a text. She had got a flat tire and that she couldn't make it. And it was like the blinders just came off. And I, it was as clear as day, the Holy Spirit talking to me. Joel, if you keep going, I'll let you go. But I'm still with you. And it was that moment that I really felt in my life that I, I have a new chance. I have a lease on life that I can actually take God up on. And from that moment on, soberness and just this awareness that God's calling me to something different. I told Sarah what had happened, and even though she was hurt, it did start us on a path to healing. We got rid of the pornography, and we forgave each other. Then we rededicated our lives to God. Every day I would just get up and I would say, who I was yesterday does not determine who I am today. I, I don't have to be the same person. And then we came together and we let 1 Corinthians 13, 4 become the guide of our lives. Love is patient, it's kind, it doesn't boast, it's not proudful, it's not, doesn't, doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It's not selfishly driven, it doesn't act unbecomingly, it bears all things, it hopes all things. It never fails. And that was really the, the turning moment in our life when the Word of God became the foundation of my life. It did take some time, but God helped me overcome my struggles with pornography and anger. And Sarah also found healing. We have a great marriage now. We do talk about everything, and our intimate life now is just unbelievable compared to what we thought was unbelievable then. There's a happy ending because of the grace of God. What an incredibly inspiring story. I, I just love stories like that, where, you know, I, I mean, imagine his surprise when he found out, I'm surprised that he didn't even, didn't even know that about his wife in mm. the first place. Yeah. But um, what an amazing testimony. Yeah, the Lord re redeemed it with great testimony. Just uh, to get to you, uh, we have a, uh, one, uh, specific one that I'm going to read out before we uh, go to our uh, guest this evening and it says pornography I would say that there is a demonic spirit behind pornography so if watched eventually people get addicted to it they come into bond bondage and oppression of the enemy the only way to get free of it is uh, is to renounce it repent and confess it and ask for forgiveness and stop watching it and start thinking of the things mentioned in Philippians. Christ will set, uh, set you free if you ask him. As a man thinks, so he, uh, is he. We have to renew our minds. 
with the word of God. And I think, you know, one mustn't underestimate the addictive nature of that because of the dopamine that's released. It's that kind of like that, uh, that, that uh, hormone that just, you know, it makes you feel good and you want to just get back on it. And I think that's one of the things. And then definitely uh, you do it enough times, the demonic can, has an open door to come in, Kurt. Yeah. yeah. Well, so thank you for writing in. Th thank you so much. And we are live and we're going to go over to Henry right now. But just before or as we go over to Henry, I want to just say um, hello to Henry's best mate, Jonah, because I asked Henry, who could I greet on television? He said, <laughs> oh, are you kidding? Yeah. And uh, Jonah. Without you, Henry said he would be worse off, meaning without you, he probably wouldn't even be on television tonight. So thanks for being a good mate. And I think that's part of it. Yes. Good friends. If you don't have good friends, yep. good accountability partners, there's no way out of addiction. You can speak to any member of AA and they'll tell you that. So thanks, uh, Jonah, for being such a good friend. I like greeting people. Yes, I yeah. think Hello. You can hear me. <laughs> so over to Henry Turnbull, who wrote a book called Behind Closed Doors, describing his six-year addiction to pornography and how he overcame it with the help of the Holy Spirit, big time, and also friends. Yeah. So welcome, Henry. So and Henry, uh, just a, a huge, huge welcome on behalf mm -hmm. of the Revelation TV viewers. We want to say welcome, welcome to Insight Live. We are just so privileged to have you. And we are so touched by your story. Mm -hmm. We just can't wait for our viewers to, uh, to hear your story and to be writing and interacting with you. Already we've got a few uh, uh, emails um, you know, on the subject. So uh, you're welcome to say hi to them. You can give them a wave and say hi. They are family. <laughs> well, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. We're really excited about this. Yeah. yeah. So just tell the viewers just about your life. I mean, how did you get involved in pornography and how on earth at such a young age did you write a book on it? Yeah, man. I mean, I always knew what pornography was because a mate of mine when I was about four explained it to me. Wow. Well, I never actually had, I never seen it, but I always understood what it was. But then when I hit secondary school, like everyone's watching it. Um, and so I just, although I knew what it was, I just wanted like to see it just to understand exactly what it was they were all talking about. Um, but unfortunately, I, my curiosity sucked me in and then I, they, I hit a point where I was like, actually, I, I want to stop watching this. But it was at that point I realized I couldn't stop watching so, it. So just slow down for me as an American. When you say in secondary school, what age were you? So I was. So I hit secondary school at 11. Okay. And then by 12, I was addicted to pornography. So you're saying that everybody is watching it at that age? Like every, yeah, everyone in my school talked about it. They show you pictures on their phone or show you magazines that they had. And, and so... I, I, I was seeing it from my yeah. mates, but I wanted to kind of understand it for myself. And that's why I went searching for it on my own. Wow. Okay. Just, you can go, you can go on. I just wanted to clarify that. So I didn't okay, know yeah. so and young. Then, so 12 years old, I was addicted to online pornography and that lasted for six years. I just, it controlled every aspect of my life. I couldn't, I couldn't sit in like a classroom without thinking about pornography and I'd just be searching my brain like, every day trying to think of like what other genres I could search for, what other videos I could search for, how I could find more videos. Um, and then eventually um, I got free uh, through the Lord. And then I just hit me that if we don't talk about this, no one's going to get free. And so I wrote a book to try and help others um, based off my own story. Yeah. Wow. That's so, so amazing. So how did you get free? Say if people are watching and they're, they're looking at you right now and, and they're saying, look, I'm not free. I've tried. I've been there and done that. You know, w w what are like the steps? I mean, I know there are steps yeah. that work for you and you'll say that to, to them. I, I know you okay. well enough. But just take us through those like steps that you, you took to overcome it. Yeah. So, so there are a few steps that, that I took. And they, they work for me, but that doesn't mean they're, they're gospel and and they'll work for everybody. And um, there'll definitely be like loads of other ways you can escape a porn addiction. Um, but the, the first thing that I had to learn to do, which is the hardest part of it, is I had to tell someone. Um, mm. And thankfully I had like amazing mates who I could talk to and they would talk to me and, and we could share anything. And so when I was eventually I was 16, so I, I kept my addiction hidden for four years. Wow. 
And then when I, when I was 16, I eventually shared what was happening with a mate. Um, and then I began talking to like all my mates. Um, and it turned out all of them were addicted to porn. So all we were just, of them? Yeah, oh, wow. all of them. So all of my best mates were all addicted to porn. Um, and we all just helped each other out, supported one another. Um, so that's sort of the main first step is you've got to tell someone because you can't escape this on your own. Um, I also uh, massively was aware or became aware that this this modern world that we live in, we're like we're just surrounded by like sex everywhere. It's you can you can't go on social media without a sexual image uh, coming up. If you watch like modern music videos, they're all just um, really sexual, um, and it's just it's thrown at us all the time every day. And although it's not necessarily pornographic, it's still really explicit. And I, just, I made a massive point of avoiding seeing it and ignoring it if, if it was there and if it was in my peripheral vision, just like not paying attention to it, not looking at it twice and just trying to cut myself off from like loads of uh, sexual images, which were just going to trigger me to want to watch porn. Um, so, so did you find that, you, you know, you, were you praying at this time? I mean, how was your spiritual life at this time? Yeah, so that, that's what I was going to say next. And so working on your faith is super important because I believe true freedom is found in Jesus. So I, I want to know what this Jesus guy is about. And so I was invested in, in my faith, which just means like rocking up to church, chatting to other Christians, reading my Bible, watching sermons online. Uh, listening to worship music, just trying to grow myself in my faith and, and walk ever closer with the Lord, um, which is super important part of escaping a porn addiction. Wow, that's uh, th that's really really impressive because I know that you know from other testimonies that it, this has really been hard, especially because of you know what you said, just the whole environment of the modern you know modern day is like it's right in your face. So I think having all those friendships, uh, you know, and, and doing that together, were all those friends of yours also Christians? Were you also kind of, they, were they pressing into God in the same way? Yeah, so all of my Christian mates were the mates who were addicted to porn. And so we would, we would sort of drag each other closer to, to Jesus, basically. And I think a friend of mine, he said to me, <laughs> when, when you watch porn, Henry, the last thing you're going to want to do is go to Jesus, but that's the first thing you have to do. But all the guilt and all the shame is going to want to want you to run away from God, but you literally need to run towards him if you want to get out of porn. And it's super tricky, but to understand because you feel so much shame and guilt, but you, you need God in your life to escape porn addiction. Mm. Did you have any like professional help at all or speaking to pastors or counselors or psychologists or psychotherapists or anything? Did you have anything like that going on? So I, I personally didn't have any professional help. I, I just had my lads around me. Wow. Um, I'm sure that like professional help, if you need it, it's definitely like you can't fault that. You can't go wrong with it. But I think, you know, having lads and good mates around you is the most important thing, e even more than professional people, because you create that positive peer pressure. You know, say, like, hey, let's, <laughs> yeah. we're like the three musketeers, man. Let, we're a team. Let's get over this thing together. And uh, I mean, you must have some, some good friendships. Yeah, definitely. I, like my mate, Jonah, like you said, Steve, if it wasn't for him and other lads, like my life would look totally different at this point. Yeah. Well, we shouted out to Jonah at the beginning. <laughs> we shout out to the other, other friends as well. So, uh, so, it's so, like gold. Yeah. So let's let's just let's mention Jonah. I mean, how how did Jonah really help you as a mate? Well, he he was just someone I could like talk to honestly and openly, who was my age, and we could have lad banter. But and he understood me because we hung out on as mates on a normal level. I think. One of the best things about mates is they don't treat you like a porn addict. Like they, they know there's more to you than that. And so, you, if you can hang out with them on a normal, everyday basis, then you can talk to them about anything, and then still go back to just being a lad. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And th and then your family, brothers, sisters, parents. Was was there any involvement there? Did you get support? So I I personally chose to keep my addiction a secret during that time, just because. 
like I was so shamed by it. Uh, they now know about it and they're very loving and supporting of like my past and also like my book that I've written. Um, but at the time, I, I just told my mates um, and that was it. Yeah. How long did it take you to write that book? Uh, it, from writing it to being holding the first copy in my hand was two and a half years. But I think that's just because I, t I took me a while to learn how to write a book, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so, I'm sure. So, no, seriously. So you did like a course or you studied up on the internet. Uh, how did you learn the, to write and do it? I'm just so impressed that you did it at such I just, a young age. I just started writing it and then I think I rewrote it four times. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I'd, send it, I'd send it to people and they'd read it and then they'd send it back and be like, nah, Henry made us. It's not great. And then I'd work <laughs> a bit. And then I sent it to a load of publishers and they all rejected me. So I worked on it a bit more. Um, and it just was like a process of learning because I, I I never read a book before so I, I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. That's amazing. Wait, wait, wait. We've got uh, Jonah has, has written a, a, an SMS here. So I'm going to read it out for you. He says, uh, thank you, Henry, Henry, for your story of freedom. I'm praying for you and praying for all those who are feeling bogged down and shame around their addiction. Who the sun sets free is free, free indeed. Bless you, bro, from Jonah. So that yes, looks Jonah. like that's your guy. All right, Jonah. <laughs> Wish we could have him on right now. Yeah, really good. <laughs> um, uh, just going to read something from Jeanette. Uh, she says, hi, great program, but quite scary that all these young men are addicted to pornography. Not it's young women men, as women. Well. Yes. Yep. I think a lot of sexual assaults could be linked to this pornography. Pray that Christians will rise up to this challenge and speak out. Thanks, Jeanette. Well, Jeanette, we're hearing that it's in the church and it's big time in the church. So we need to be praying for the church first to be well, free. Let me just slow down here and mm -hmm. I want to ask Henry a question. Um, like, look, when I grew up, I just thought that uh, pornography was a guy thing. And if I heard about a girl addicted to pornography, that didn't compute in my mind. I would, I would never think about it. How prevalent is it amongst women? I mean, you're talking about 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds. Just how widespread is it amongst women, for example? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's huge. I wasn't aware of it during my own addiction. And when I was getting free, everyone who was helping me was a lad. But then when I started writing my book, I started asking myself the question, well, how is this for, for girls and for women? And then I started asking around and asking uh, some other friends. And, and I, I, I got a load of stories uh, from both guys and girls for my book. And I realized how many, how many people have, of both genders were struggling with this and and it's not it is often seen as a guy thing and i think one of the mistakes the church can make is talking to the lads about porn addiction but they need to talk to everyone about porn addiction because yeah. it's not just a lad problem yeah because as a, as a woman it's almost like a double shame like if you're in a youth meeting or something and a guy just stands up says i'm addicted to pornography you know that 90 percent of the other kids are, are too but when a female yeah. says it then suddenly She's a bit of a pariah, a bit different, and I don't think it's going to be like, for example, we did a program on infertility. Now, if you're in a large church and you say, any woman who's struggling with infertility, please raise your hand so we can pray for you, and they'll all raise their hand, no yeah. problem. But guys will not do that. Mm. Guys don't talk about being infertile. They're part of uh, the equation as well. And we saw on our program that this is not really a guy thing, mm. confessing in fertility. So yeah. I think there's a lot of sexism. And one of the things I like about the Song of Solomon in the sexual relationship that this couple has, do you know that the girl initiates sexual activity more than the guy does? In yeah. the Song of Solomon, it's, yeah. it's so contemporary. <clears throat> I think we have so much to learn from that as a, as a, a, a great model. Well, I was, you know, noticing from our, our first uh, video that we showed, where the the woman had had, you know, she'd actually been abused sexually, and her perpetrator was using uh, pornography to, to to do whatever he was doing. So, you know, I mean, in my understanding, a lot of women who go into it have already been exposed through some kind of, uh, you know, either incest or some kind of abuse that has actually opened them to that. Um, so, I mean, I don't know whether you, because I haven't read your book yet, uh, uh, Henry, so I don't know whether any of your stories on the female side ha have had elements of that. Uh, did you, have you noticed any of that? Uh, not necessarily in the stories of my, uh, in the book, but definitely um, I know people who, who use porn 
to escape some sort of pain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Any other emails? We have? Um, yep, we have here. This is from Les. Thanks, Les. And you said uh, be uh, because the weapon of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to pulling down the th of strongholds, pornography can become a stronghold. We have to cast down imaginations such as pornography and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ by renewing our minds with the word of God. Now, I mean, that is the truth of the word of God, but the practicality is if you're alone, if you're bored, if you are trying to, as Henry said, kind of like deal with some pain and use either food or pornography or one of these addictive behaviors, alcohol or drugs, that's the thing where we, we actually try to use something else to, uh, to cover our pain, to be able to heal ourselves or to fill that void. And it's right. If yeah. you can turn to the word of God, it will change you. But a lot of people, Henry, what do you think about this? A lot of people won't turn to the word of God because that's not an instinctive thing that you do when you're Look, in your sin. I've just turned to the Song of Solomon. <laughs> Can't get much better than that. But, <laughs> but, but anyway, Henry, what do you say? Yeah, I mean, like, like I said before, going to the word of God or anything like God related was the last thing I wanted to do after looking at porn. Um, but that, like, God wants you to come to him when you look at porn. He's not up there like on his big throne judging us. He loves us and, and he knows we're caught in something like, bigger than ourselves. And he understands that we need like love and practical steps and commitment to get out of it. He's not just like, man, what are you doing? Like you're, you're failing me, you're letting me down. He, he's a loving God. And so he'll, he wants to be there for us and he is there for us. Yeah. Like after we've looked at porn, we just have to get that in our minds that we can go to him, even though our minds will be telling us we can't go to him. Mm. Yeah. So as, as a young man, uh, being 22, when you visit churches <laughs> and you go to conferences and so on, is anybody addressing this in a very profound, intelligent, engaging way? Um, I, I mean, when I was growing up, I, didn't, I never had anyone to speak to me about it. Um, I think the church is waking up to it like now, but we need to be hitting it a lot more and a lot better than we are at the minute because we live in this mad society and world where it's, it's so easy, easily accessible from such a young age that we need to be chatting to kids about it yeah. before they're teenagers because like for me and for all my mates, by the time we were teenagers, it was way too late. Yeah. Wow. Because this is why I said, you know, in an engaging, insightful, wise, intelligent manner, because people will tell you, they'll quote a verse, a verse of scripture, you know, say, well, you know, it's like saying to an alcoholic, just don't take up another drink. Yeah. But you forget the process. Les mentioned renewing your mind. Mm. Renewing your mind is, is terrible. It, it's so difficult to do that. It's a discipline. It, it's, it's a discipline and it, it involves allowing. And one thing I've noticed about Henry that I admire about you, Henry, I, I think it's a gift that you're going to develop and discover. You're a good mobilizer of people. I notice how you get your friends involved, you opened up, they have the same problem. And then when you're writing your book, you, you ask people, you, you send your manuscript to people. And there's something, I think God ministers to us. We usually think he ministers directly to us, and of course he does. But usually in scripture, he ministers to, to us through other people mm. and friends. And if we're lonely, and I think loneliness in the UK you actually have what's called a minister of loneliness. We don't have a minister of loneliness in America. And when people are lonely, time on their hands, and it's just an addiction waiting to happen mm. without good friendships. Absolutely. One of the things that I'd like to ask you, uh, Henry, is that, you know, as a, as a mother, and having grown up with my mom being pretty honest with me, uh, we lived in, in Africa and... Uh, I think it depends on how you grow up and where you grow up. But generally, when you're thinking of, a, of an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old, you're thinking that this is still a child. So you're not thinking, 
well, let me just t teach them all about everything and expose all this stuff to them. It's almost like against our value system. It's almost like, well, okay, let's wait till they're 12 and they have a little more maturity and they're able to be able to catch it. But in the modern day society, from what you're saying and from the testimonies that I've heard, you're looking, I mean, the fact that you said you knew what it was at four. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So I can't so, even conceive of that. So I mean, how would you visualize if you were talking to parents or if you were talking to, say, uh, church groups that were doing camps or things like that? What What would you advise them? What age and how would you see them approaching this? You know, the most important thing to remember is if you don't teach them, the world will teach them. Yes. So wow. either you choose what you want to teach them or you let the world teach them. That's that's up to you. That they're, they're your children. Yeah. But I think I think the smart move is you teach them before yep. the world does. Yeah. And uh, in terms of how young, I mean, one of my friends whose story is in the book, he was addicted from the age of five. Ooh, uh, what? Another guy who's who's also in the oh. book, his his story started when he was eight years old. Um, so it's got to be before the age of 10. Um, yes. Otherwise, it's just too late. That's the truth of it. It's just too late. Wow. But tell us a little bit about the guy who became addicted at five years old. I, I used to hate girls. If I saw a girl yeah, kiss somebody cooties. or something, I, oh, I would <laughs> just like cooties. freak out. I mean, you know, just tell me a little bit about that story in your, in your book. So he, 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 didn't, he didn't quite understand what he was watching. But he got he got exposed to it from another friend. I don't know how that friend found out about it at such a young age. But he there's something about pornography that you just want to watch more. And so this lad from the age of five, he would he would sneak down uh, at night and get his parents' laptop and, and just look at porn from the age of five, just look at it, and then that developed uh, into masturbation and just a full blown addiction that lasted nearly 20 years for him wow wow oh, wow that's really really sad yeah. very very sad but i like wow. what you said i mean that's that's a warning it says if we don't teach them the world will teach them yeah. and the world will teach them big time yeah showing no mercy and what he said is if you just see a little bit it's going to be more and more and more and more so this is happening i mean you heard you know if you're watching today that it started, I mean, like 11, 12 year olds, and he said basically in his entire circle of friends, non Christians as well as Christian, this is just like an epidemic, a pandemic taking over. And I think, as a, I'm a pastor, you know, and of course, it's awkward sometimes to talk about sex. And I remember one time, Melanie, I was so brutally honest, man, I used every you know, some people just were so uncomfortable they wanted to walk out because I was using, you know, some of the vulgar expressions. But I was just saying to people, you know, look, uh, I mean, this is reality. This is what people are grappling with. And then I went to town on the Song of Solomon, which mm. I did right here. Mm. I think, well, maybe I'm crazy, you know, but I think if I was leading a camp of young people, yes, I would read the Song of Solomon. And I would get them to rewrite it and everything. And yes, parents might accuse me, oh, Kurt, you're going too far. But I'm saying, look, you know, the world teaches them or let the Bible. Yeah. You know, let, let them wait for sex. Yeah. Let them value it so much. You know, it's like you're going to a good restaurant and you know it's the best restaurant and you've saved up all year to go to this, to this particular restaurant and there's a queue and you can smell the smell, but you're waiting. You're not just rushing in because you see the value. But if you think, you know, sex, you're cheap and this is a pathway to popularity, whatever. And I've heard of so many women and they don't even enjoy sex. It's just, mm. they do it because they think they have to do it to show love to the guy. And there's all these screwy, weird yeah. ideas out there. So if we're gonna talk about sex, you know, let's talk about it you know, from this perspective. And I don't see many people doing that, having that boldness, but yet it's a pandemic. Mm. It's like, you know, we have a vaccine and all these people around us are dying and we're not even using the vaccine because we might offend a couple of people. Mm. I don't know. Well, I just wanted to mention about the kind of a school situation. You know, we've been reading in the, the papers 
that kids are being taught earlier and earlier and earlier on about you know various options uh, around sexuality and they're being taught very early you know early about that but they're not being taught any biblical um, views about actually keep yourself pure and uh, this is God's design for you so that is completely out of out of the school so we it's almost like experimentation and what you want is is the deal so I mean Henry what would you say I mean you know you are you know a, 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 a follower of Jesus I mean uh, how horrific do you feel that the whole system in the schools uh, are right now I mean obviously of course I feel uh the Bible and, and God and Christianity and Jesus should be in our education systems. Um, and I, I, it is sad that the kids aren't, aren't seeing that or learning about that and they're not understanding that. Um, but it just, it just means that as a church, we need to, we need to be there to, to, to love them and, and show them the love of Jesus and, uh, and teach them that Jesus ways are, are actually, are life giving to yeah. us. Yeah. Beautiful. That's a good answer. I have a uh, an email here from Jean. Hi, Jean. Great that you're watching. And uh, you wanted to comment on Henry. And you said, hi, guys. Henry is a wonderful young man. I feel he is going to go places. He could go into schools, tell his story. Bless you, Henry. And that's love from Jean. So you're getting some encouragement there, Henry, from some of our viewers. And, you know, remembering that a lot of our viewers are probably grandparents or great grandparents. We do have older viewership, but we do have some young viewership. So what about um, what would you think uh, would be your recommendation if, we, if you were talking to grandparents now? Uh, you know, obviously there's differences with generations, Henry. Uh, but if, if like you were a grandparent and you were seeing your grandchildren uh, being exposed or perhaps falling into something that would be this modern societal exposure to, you know, early porn, etc. What would you uh, be telling the grandparents that are watching yeah. tonight? You know, it, it doesn't matter your age. If you're still here, you can still make an influence. So teach them what you know. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. But we, you just have to get the parents' uh, permission. But, you know, pa I, I think grandparents are so influential. Yeah. You know, grandparents that, that, uh, that play, you know, play with the kids, take them places. It's those quiet conversations over an ice cream or a game of Scrabble or whatever the case is. Those conversations, I think, Henry, are the places where these kids are going to pick up uh, wisdom, you know, godly wisdom from the grandparents. So we want to really encourage our viewers, uh, don't hold back. You know, these are your grandchildren or your great grandchildren that are on the, you know, the, the sacrificial altar of today's society, of today's culture. And, you know, Jesus would just encourage you as Henry is encouraging you, use your opportunity to talk to your kids, uh, your grandkids, your great grandkids. Kurt. So, so I want to ask you something. I mean, this book obviously would be a fantastic gift. You're asking a question yes. about grandparents, yes. etc. Look, and if, and if addiction to pornography is so prevalent, I think it would be just a great gift yes. for people. And, yes. and that's one of the best things. Read this book. My mom would give me books, just drown me with books, and I would read them all. I, I love books. My, my mom was so influential in my life by just giving me quality literature, but how do we get um, hold of your book? And then really, who's it targeting? Well, so you can, you can buy it online, just search Henry Turnbull behind closed doors. Um, and then, yeah, just start reading it. And I actually, I tried to make it a practical book. So there's lots of like questions in there and places you can write or doodle and like think about things and reflect on, on your own journey. And, uh, and then, and just like sort of try and understand your journey, not just like, oh, read a book. Yeah, anyone can read a book, but actually like be challenged by the book. So it's like an interactive book almost. You, you interact yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, okay. for sure. Okay. Do, do, is, could you do it with somebody else or is it really a person? Like a group you, Bible study or something? Group uh, yeah, well, could you do it with groups? Could you do it with another person or is it best to do it on your own? You could definitely do it on your own, but you can definitely do it uh, with other people 
or as a group i do i do suggest in in the book that if you're if you're going through an addiction you want to you want to tell someone but then i also suggest that whoever you tell should also read the book so you know you're kind of both on the same page of what you're reading and understanding and what the steps you're going through that's excellent yeah wow well, we, we, we can't highly recommend it enough uh, for our, uh, you know, for our viewers to actually buy it as a gift for their children, for their grandchildren, uh, or maybe great grandchildren, because we have some elderly viewers here. Yeah. And uh, so there it is, Behind Closed Doors, Henry Turnbull, a wonderful uh, interactive book yeah. that will be extremely helpful. Perhaps this will be the book that will be the signature of turning your child, your grandchild, or your great grandchild uh, to to the Lord and away from this absolutely demonic addiction that uh, you know holds you hours and hours. But uh, but, but slow down. I just got I got to think. Why not? This is not just a book, right? I would say it, it's more as a tool. So your question about how can grandparents, parents, yeah. and so yeah. on, what's preventing? What would be preventing me when my son is 11 years old? So if my son is 11 or 12 years old, I can assume that he sees his friend watching pornography. Yeah. I can assume that. That is an assumption. No matter what English school you go to, in the, in the whole UK, wherever you are, you can assume that. And so this reading it with them and discussing yeah. it with them based on that book would be a fabulous tool. And you right. can say goodbye. Yeah, so uh, Henry, we uh, are just finishing our program now. So we want to thank you so much for taking time out for being with us. We are thrilled with your success on this book and we just, you know, we can't promote it enough. Thank you for the wisdom that you've given us. It's amazing to see a young man following the Lord like this with such a conviction. So we thank you so much for being with us. We bless you. We bless all your friends and Noah as well. Jonah. And Jonah, sorry, sorry, not Jonah. <laughs> Jonah. And, yeah, yeah, not Noah, Jonah. And we also uh, hope that your parents uh, watch this uh, on catch up. And <laughs> that hey, they, I'll say, I'll say hi to you. them right now. Hi, all parents. Right. <laughs> so thank you so much. God bless you. We just pray. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, we pray God's blessing over you, your work, and the ministry that God will give you through this book. So in Jesus' name, we just. Uh, we just pray his blessing over you right now. Thank you so much, okay. uh, Henry, God for being with Henry. us. God bless you. Okay. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. 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 Wow. wow. What? I know. I know. I'm, I'm just so <laughs> impressed with Henry. I, mm -hmm. I'm actually so proud of him. Uh, this is just an amazing uh, thing that he's done to actually just cancel the enemy's uh, c curse on him. I think there has to be preventative counseling. What I mean by that, or, or like, for example, you're a parent and you can assume that your child will be exposed to this, but before the world gets to him, you better get to him. Mm. The churches better get to him. And it has to be an open discussion right there out on the, the table. Well, we have time for one more email here. Thank you for writing in. I'm a pupil support teacher. There are some concerns about the relationship education we teach in Scotland. However, there is a big focus on the importance of respect and trust in relationships, which is a massive improvement since the 1980s and 1990s. And the church has largely failed to deal with anything related to human sexuality. As a man, uh, the church is the last place I would seek help about stuff like this because it's based on judgment and not compassion. Well, thank you for writing in on that. And that is a sad indictment on the church that, that why would sexual uh, you know, addiction to pornography be anything different from lying, from cheating, from you know, whatever other else but uh, we're not that addressing, they are gossiping. We're not addressing human sexuality. We yeah. don't mention it. And it's, yeah. and it's really, Absolutely. it's really sad. And God, we just pray that you'd wake us up as a church, you know, us as pastors, wake us up, help us throughout the world to talk about this in a way that's after your own heart. And we, we just have about 40 more seconds. It's been great to be with you. I wish we could see your faces on, on big screens. Maybe we'll have that technology. Yeah, we want to encourage you but, to get, get mm. online and buy uh, you know, Henry Turnbull's book, Behind Closed Doors. Give it as a gift to somebody. You never know how the Holy Spirit is going to use this book. This has been a wonderful time to be with you. Thank you. It's been a delicate subject. Many of you may not have wanted to write in, but thank you for being with us. Do share this program. There is Catch Up TV as well. Thank you for being with us tonight. And if Kurt. you are struggling with pornography, we just declare victory over you and get that book. Reach out to somebody. Reach out and get that victory. 
in Jesus' name. And thank you so much for being with us. And we will see you as usual next week. Love for you guys. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.